Boy, it's been a while since we did a spoiler talk, hasn't it? Hey everyone, it's me, Thorgy, and back before this channel became dedicated to fighting games, we used to do spoiler talks on big new video game releases, but I didn't have plans on ever doing another one. Up until I played through Tekken 8 story mode, and hot damn, we need to talk about that. Or more specifically, we need to talk about the ending of it, because there's a whole lot of amazing stuff that happens throughout this story mode, but I'll let you guys in on some behind the scenes stuff here. This is the second time I'm recording this because the first time that I recorded it, I tried to do it without a script or notes or anything like that, and it just evolved into an hour of me going, oh man, isn't Leroy cool, and what's up with Reyna, and oh man, King was wild in Tekken Forces, and holy cow, Tekken Forces! And wait, let me go back and talk about that thing from half an hour ago because it was also cool. Yeah, this story mode is jam-packed with crazy, amazing moments, and I kind of got overhyped when talking about it. So, let's try this again, but this time I'm going to mostly focus on the big events at the end of the game. However, there are a handful of notes that I want to touch on before we get to that third act, because even though I want to keep this video focused, I still have to geek out a bit because if you're a Tekken fan, this story mode is the biggest feast you have had in years. So here goes. Just a few rapid fire talking points and yes, for that one person who needs to hear it, there will be spoilers in this spoiler talk. Doesn't feel like I need to say that, but I've been on YouTube long enough to know, yes, somebody always needs to hear that. Okay, big bullet points to talk about. I think this might be the best fighting game story mode ever. And believe me, I'm aware that isn't the highest praise because fighting game story modes aren't known for the seal of quality. There's a couple of good ones out there, almost all of them coming from NetherRealm Studios, but most fighting game story modes eh, kind of stink. They tend to either suffer from one of two problems. Either they struggle too hard to force fights in there, so you've got tons of moments where characters just bump into each other and then say, Hey, what's your problem? I don't like your face. Or they do what Tekken 7 did, where there's too much talking. Yeah, after the long, monotone narrator droning on and on in that game, I was starting to get numb to that story mode. And that's not even the biggest problem with that story mode. That story mode also has no idea what wants to focus on. It just kept jumping from one thing to another, just trying to jam random moments in there so that way it could build up whatever plot points it needed to build up. Although, I will say, even with all those problems, the ending of that story was amazing. It is one of the best moments in all of Tekken's history. But everything leading up to that was kind of rough. But here, you got a story where there's tons of fights, but they don't feel forced. All of them actually fit into the story, and they're spread out pretty well. You never go too long without a fight, but they're also not just stacked on top of each other. They do give you time to breathe in between them. And each of these fights move the plot ahead. They each make sense, and in some cases, they even use the fights to tell the story. And in Tekken 8, Jin is the protagonist. This is his story that we're following, but unlike Tekken 7 story mode, where nobody outside of Heihachi or Kazuya mattered, they made sure to give every other character something to do in here. It might not have been a big world-shattering moment, but if you're a fan of these characters, they each got something that fans will appreciate. Like, Leo is a cool character. I like them back in Tekken 6, but in Tekken 7, they just had a goofy cutscene with Yoshimitsu, who they have zero connection to. Like, they did not matter at all, even in their own arcade ending. But in here, Leo found their missing father, something that had been established all the way back in Tekken 6. And we see how Leo feels confronting Jin, the guy who used to lead the Mishima Zaibatsu, the organization that killed Leo's mother. That's some pretty solid story stuff for Leo. But even the characters who didn't get as much screen time as Leo, they still got something. Paul and Kuma have had this weird rivalry in the past, so Kuma accidentally sacrificing himself for Paul and seeing Paul's reaction was great. Leroy didn't get much to do in the last game, considering that he was a DLC character and none of the DLC characters even got arcade endings in that game. But here, you find out what his relationship is with Kazuya, what he's been doing in New York, how he feels about the Mishima Zaibatsu, and he provides a really great moment with Jin where he gives him some words of encouragement that he needed to hear. 
Also, this one is just a personal one for me that I have to throw out there, but I learned that Leroy is voiced by Bo Billingsley, the voice of Jet Black in Cowboy Bebop, and that fact alone makes me want to main Leroy. I love Jet Black, and he absolutely killed it in this role. And Hua Rang was Jin's rival in Tekken 3, but with each game, their rivalry got pushed further and further into the background. But here, we got Hua Rang challenging Jin in the big tournament, and that helped him to get his spirit back. It helped him learn how to fight again. He pushed his rival ahead the thing a rival is supposed to do in a story. And Xiao Yu actually for the first time in a while talked about how she always used to want to open an amusement park when she was younger, which was this fun, silly thing about her character in the older games. But now she sort of talks about like, yeah, that was just something I wanted as a kid, which shows some growth for her character. But then she and Jin kind of bond over this dream. He tells her that it's not such a bad dream after all, and that's great because it takes this silly thing from the older games and it makes it sweet. But more importantly, we also finally get some good bonding between Jin and Xiao Yu. For like 25 years now, that romance has been almost entirely one-sided. Xiao Yu has been all into Jin, and Jin has been all into revenge and dealing with the devil gene. So seeing him and Xiao Yu actually gain a moment in the story to bond was great. And as a lifelong King fan, yeah, King doesn't really get any story in this game. But when the game suddenly jumps into Tekken Force mode, which that in and of itself is an amazing tribute to the older Tekken games, the fact that they actually put a mini version of the old Tekken beat em up modes in here made me just pop off. I love seeing that. Sure, it doesn't control all that great, but it never controlled all that great in the older games either, so that actually kind of makes this an even more fitting tribute. But when King is taking on all these soldiers, and then the soldiers on his side start cheering King, 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 that is a great tribute to his character because King is a pro wrestler. He draws power from the crowd cheering him on. So even if there isn't any story development for King, he gets a moment to shine. The game realizes that even though this is Jin's story, there are other characters in here, and people like those characters. Maybe we should give them all some good moments. Now, that being said, there are some character moments in here that didn't work. First is Azucena, and let me just start off by saying I really like Azucena. She's got a great fun personality, she's got lots of style, a unique moveset, she is a wonderful addition to Tekken. But when she pops up in the big climactic war fighting on the villain side, and her reason for joining them is because she believes that if she sells coffee with G-Core, it will lead to world peace? Listen, I know Tekken can be goofy. Hell, the goofiness of Tekken is one of the most charming things about Tekken. But if this really is supposed to be the big climactic war that this franchise has been leading up to for 30 years now, I can't help but feel like I'd rather Azucena had been saved for DLC, and we threw in there a character who might have had a little bit more impact on the story. And she's not the only one who doesn't really contribute anything to being on the villain side. I could say the same thing about Fang. But at least Fang has been sitting over there as a threat since Tekken 5, and he hasn't actually done anything in the main story other than just being intimidating. So seeing him actually do something in the story was kind of cool. And he went up against Leroy, so you've got the old wise master who wants power to protect people going up against the angry warrior who wants power just for himself. It's a tale as old as time, it's a cliche, but I love it. I love seeing that struggle between those two sides, so I'm cool with it. But Azucena, yeah, again, I do really like her character. I think she's very cool. But for this big climactic battle, I do wish we had another character who was more important to the overall Tekken story in that spot, and they had saved Azucena for DLC. But that's not the biggest problem with the characters. That would be Asuka and Lily. Someone on the Tekken staff loves Asuka and demands that she keep coming back. And then there's about three or four other people on Tekken staff who hate Asuka and love Lily. Because when Asuka popped up in Tekken 5 and we learned she was June's niece, meaning she was Jin's cousin, and she had the same powers that June had that could keep the devil gene in check, 
I and so many other fans looked at that and got hyped because it meant, oh my god, Jin, the guy who lost his mother and whose father and grandfather tried to kill him, is going to find out that he still has family out there. Family that isn't a dick. And it's a family that can help him with his curse. This is going to be huge. This is going to be a major moment for Jin. This is going to be a great new dynamic with this brand new breakout star character. And then Lily got added to Tekken and Asuka never mattered to the story again. Yeah, Asuka's entire purpose of the story was now just to be rivals with Lily. And there came a moment in this story mode where Asuka sees her family tree and she realizes that Jin is her cousin and Jin realizes that Asuka is his cousin. And I thought, oh my God, they're finally going to talk about this. And then Jin immediately turned back to Lily and Asuka didn't say a word for the rest of the story mode. Damn, talk about just throwing a story opportunity into the trash. That was almost insulting. Like, it's one thing if neither of them know, but seeing them find out and then having zero reaction to it is wild. Then again, Asuka's ending in Tekken 6 shows that she already knew she was related to him, but then in later games, they treat it like she doesn't know, and then at the start of this story mode, Hwarang says, hey, aren't you like Jin's sister or something? But then Asuka acts like that's a joke, so... Yeah, I honestly don't think anyone on Tekken cares about this family connection. I think it's a great opportunity for some more story with these characters, but I guess I'm alone on that. But I will admit, as someone who wants to see Jin get some good family members in his life, Lars stepped up in this story. I never cared about Lars, but I am a sucker for those moments in a story where the hero needs time. He's charging up the spirit bomb, but it's not ready yet so the other heroes have to buy him that time. I love those moments when the good guys are severely outclassed, but they just have to hold the bad guys off long enough for the pro tag to jump in. And when Lars is having to hold off true devil Kazuya all by himself, and you get that one shot of Lars standing back up, and Kazuya sees a flash of Heihachi from the fight in the last game, I think that one moment right there actually made me like Lars more than anything else he's done in this entire series. In fact, there are a bunch of those we have to hold off the bad guys to buy Jin time moments. Zhao Yu having to fight back a whole squad of Jax units all by herself is one of the coolest things that Zhao Yu has ever done. And then there's that moment at the Coliseum where all the heroes have to fight Kazuya while Jin escapes along with Lily and Asuka who is struggling to get into the fight so that way she can matter to the story. Ah, oh, poor Asuka. But that moment was great too. Hell, that moment made me actually like Claudio. Claudio was the least hyped character in this roster. Nobody cared about Claudio coming back. Even the people who played Tekken 7 story mode were like, who the hell is Claudio? He was just some guy that Heihachi talked to in one scene and that was it. Why is he coming back? Then Claudio says, I'll tell you why I'm coming back. I'm an exorcist. I'm the one guy who can take down Devil Kazuya. And then he sacrifices himself to hold Kazuya off. I couldn't help but think about Street Fighter V story mode, which isn't the only time that I'm going to bring that up in this video. But I couldn't help but think about Street Fighter V story mode and about how Nash throughout that entire story mode kept talking about how he had to stop Bison. And then it all led up to Nash fighting Bison, and then Nash dies without accomplishing anything. Nash's sacrifice, his entire story throughout this entire game, amounted to nothing. He didn't weaken Bison, he didn't discover Bison's fatal flaw, he didn't give him even a scratch that Ryu could use to hit later on for some big finishing move. His whole story didn't matter at all. But then here, you got Claudio sacrificing himself. Claudio has no real history in this franchise. He's got no real impact on the narrative. And yet when he sacrifices himself to stall Devil Kazuya, he actually did it. He actually held Devil Kazuya back. His sacrifice mattered. 
He bought Jin and his team the time that they needed to go out there and do what they had to do. That is how you make a character sacrifice themselves. That is how you make it matter. Zafina's death, on the other hand, eh, could have been done better. Kind of shocking that a character who actually did matter to the previous games got killed off so quickly. I was actually shocked it happened and didn't even believe it for a couple of minutes. But that led to the resurrection of Azazel, and that was a great surprise. I had no idea that was going to happen. That didn't get spoiled by anyone. And I always love seeing old boss fights pop back up, and he is loaded with all his crazy BS from Tekken 6. And it's a simple but effective way to really hype up your new villain. If you want the villain of the newest game to feel bigger and badder than the villain from the old game, just have him beat up the villain from the old game. It's prison rules. You want me to think someone is tough? Have them beat up the biggest bad guy there. But okay, that was a quick rundown of all the stuff that I wanted to cover. I know it was all over the place, but trust me, that was still infinitely clearer than how it sounded without my cliff notes. But let's actually take a look at Jin and talk about all that happened to him because this, this was where the story went from fun character moments to something really special. When Jin goes to that big giant tree, the sacred Cosma family landmark, he goes to sleep and goes into the spirit world where he gets to see his mom again. And I should mention that after you beat the story mode, there is a brand new cutscene that gets unlocked in the gallery that shows what happened to June during Tekken 3. And it shows that after Jin ran off, she lured Ogre to this site where she was able to draw on the spiritual power of this location in order to defeat him, but then she laid there dying. It says she was gravely wounded, and she also starts hearing her family lullaby, and I assume that was basically them saying, she's dying, so she's hearing her ancestors in the spirit realm. But then, when you play through her story campaign, the announcer says that she actually did survive. She was just in some sort of a spirit coma for all this time, having a long-running nightmare about Jin and Kazuya fighting each other, but now she's awake. I'll talk more about that later, but let's just say I'm still not entirely sure how I feel about this explanation, and her presence in the story is still a little up in the air for me. But Jin goes into the spirit world, and in there, he confronts the devil gene. And this, to me, is the biggest confrontation in this game, because in Tekken 7, Heihachi versus Kazuya was huge because those two have constantly been at each other's throats throughout this entire franchise. But when it comes to Jin and Kazuya, I think they've really only had like one canonical interaction. Outside of the canon, they've gone back and forth multiple times, but canonically, I think they've only had one interaction at the end of Tekken 4. Maybe I'm forgetting something huge, what is and is not canon in Tekken 6 is kind of confusing after all. But my point is, the two of them have never really had that many interactions. And that's because Jin's big struggle has always been, not with Kazuya, but with the Devil Gene. So this moment of him confronting it is probably the biggest deal for his character in this entire game. And just to bring up Street Fighter V story mode one more time, I was delighted that he actually did confront it. Yeah, notice how much more effective it is when the confrontation between someone and the evil dwelling within themselves that they've been fighting for over two decades now at this point is resolved on camera. Notice how Jin didn't just show up and say that everything had been resolved off screen. I will never let Capcom live that down. Anyway, back to the fight between Jin and Devil Jin. This is such a good moment for his character, and the scene is loaded with details. When you get to the second phase of that fight, and Devil Jin is sitting on the throne that Jin was sitting on when he overtook the Mishima Zaibatsu, heck, I think he's even in the exact same pose when you reach Jin in the arcade ladder of Tekken 6. Oh, that gave me chills seeing that. That lets you know that the people making this game have love for this story. They care so much about those small details. But we get a moment of Jin actually talking to the devil gene inside of himself, and he realizes it's not some invasive darkness inside of himself, it's an extension of him. 
It was full of so much anger because Jin was full of so much anger. And in the end, the devil gene has always just been trying to protect Jin. Which might sound like a bit of a cop-out, but when you look back at his history, yeah, the devil gene typically came out whenever Jin was about to die. So Jin learns to accept this part of himself. And that's kind of what this entire story is about. In the end, the story of Tekken 8 is not really about Jin taking out Kazuya. It's about Jin accepting who he is. Accepting that he's done horrible things in the past. But he also has to accept his friends. He has to accept that there are people out there that care about him. And he has to accept life. There's a moment in the big final battle where he says something along the lines of, I won't deny my existence. And you can totally interpret that to mean multiple different things. You can interpret that to mean he won't ignore the Mijima bloodline within himself. He won't ignore the devil gene. He won't run away from the horrible things that he did in the previous games. But if you want to go a few layers deeper with it, you can also interpret that as Jin saying that he wants to live. Because if there is any fighting game protagonist out there who probably suffers from depression, it's gotta be Jin. His mom died when he was a kid. His home burned down right in front of him. He met his grandfather who beat the crap out of him for four years with intense training. Then his grandfather tried to kill him. Then his dad came back from the dead and his dad tried to kill him. All while he has had some evil darkness inside of himself that was causing him to hurt others around him. Yeah, Jin has been through enough emotional damage to last several lifetimes. And it made me look back at what he did in Tekken 6, where he starts a war to try and bring out the source of the devil gene. But it made me think on some level, and sorry to get really dark here, but maybe on some level, he didn't intend to survive that. I mean, what's more deadly than a war? Starting up a war automatically increases your chances of dying. But more importantly, he started up a new King of the Iron Fist tournament, with him now as the final boss. And what exactly happened to the last couple of hosts of the King of the Iron Fist tournament? Yeah, that's not a job that comes with a long life expectancy. So maybe I'm reading too much into this, but maybe on some level. Over the past few games, after everything that Jin had been through, he had been trying to die. But Think about what happens in this game. He got reassured by his friends that there are people out there that care about him. He got support from what family he still had. Not Asuka, but Lars and Lee were there. He got words of encouragement that he needed to hear from Leo and Leroy. He faced his own past and he faced the bad things that he had done in his life. And then after that, he got to talk to June and he got to realize that he still has a connection to his mom even if she's gone. This whole game was about Jin not just accepting his past and who he was, but also him realizing that he wanted to live. At least, that's how I interpreted it. I could be way off, but if that's what we were supposed to take away from all this, that's really impressive that they had a character arc that was that serious and that deep in a fighting game. And if that is what they were going for with Jin, he might be the best protagonist in any fighting game. I seriously can't think of another fighting game protagonist that has had a deeper, more meaningful journey than that. Now after saying all that serious stuff, it's gonna be really hard to transition into the giant space fight, but here goes. So Jin gets his power up and he now becomes... Angel Jin? Yeah, let's go with that. I'm okay with this design, he looks like a cross between a Final Fantasy character and a knight from Saint Seiya, but it's a good contrast to the Devil Kazuya design. And then they get blasted up into space where they have a fight on a rock that is plummeting through Earth's atmosphere, which... Yeah, you know what? No notes. That's just cool. What else needs to be said? But they end up colliding and they end up burning out all traces of the Devil Gene from each other. At long last, the Devil Gene is completely gone. <laughs> uh, hold on, I'm coming to you. We'll get back to you in just a second. But the rock crashes down, and I am so glad that the fight didn't end with them in space, because as epic as that was, when I think of Tekken, 
I don't think of two gods fighting in space. No, when I think of Tekken, I picture two angry shirtless guys beating the crap out of each other with their bare fist as Mother Nature is going wild all around them. And that is exactly what we got here, and it's maybe the most epic setting for a final battle in any fighting game. Yes, they gave us the fight in the reveal trailer, and again, no notes. This entire sequence is incredible. So many gorgeous set pieces and shots like Kazuya punching Jin as the wave crashes around them, and the combat itself leans into this. The in-game mechanics are used to make the fight feel far more intense, and none of it is scripted. It's stuff that you, the player, are pulling off in the combat itself, and yet it's still so hype that it feels like something that had to be scripted, like, we all love when the camera zooms in for the big climactic final hits in Tekken, and it starts doing that in overtime during this fight, and it feels amazing. And there's so many Easter eggs, but probably the most brilliant moment in the entire story mode, and another reason why I say this might be the best fighting game story mode, is because they actually use the fighting to tell the story. Not to progress the story, no, using a fight to progress the story just means, oh, we beat the bad guy, we accomplished our goal. No, I mean they actually use something in the fight, the fight that you, the player, are controlling to progress the story. Now, you've been seeing my gameplay, and I'll admit right now, Tekken was always my go-to button masher. I always just hit buttons in that game, I never learned how to do anything special in them, I just played it for some casual fun, so I have zero muscle memory for any of this, and I did not go into training mode or anything before this. The moment I got the game, I wanted to go right into the story mode because I was afraid that somebody out there might spoil something for me. So I apologize that my gameplay is so horrible, it's just the worst, I fully admit that. But after an hour of playing as Jin, I was starting to figure some stuff out. But suddenly, after a brief cutscene, Jin does the pose from the cover of Tekken 3, and then that theme from Tekken 3 started playing, and I thought, ooh, that's good. That is some good nostalgia pumping right into my veins. But then I started playing, and suddenly, Jin didn't feel the same. Something was off. Everything I had been working with for the past hour wasn't working the same anymore. But then, as I was trying to figure out what was going on, all of a sudden, I saw a brief flash of the Hell Kick. A Mishima move. The fighting style that Jin threw away after Tekken 3 in order to try and separate himself from his father and grandfather. And I realized, Oh, that's why it's different. Because Jin is different. Jin is no longer running from who he is. The Mishima fighting style is a part of him, and he is no longer ashamed of it, and he is willing to use it again for the first time in five games. And they do not tell you, the player, that that is what is happening until after this fight. After you go one round with Kazuya like this, he then says, I thought you threw away the Mishima style. Before that, they don't tell you. Instead, the fight itself is there to let you understand what Jin is going through. And that is an amazing way of telling this story. And from there, Jin starts pulling out elements of June's moveset, Devil Jin's moveset. Jin said he was accepting his past. And that's exactly what he does through battle. I'll repeat myself, they use the fighting in a fighting game story mode to tell the story, to explore Jin's character and to show his growth as it was happening, and that is brilliant. But after that, Jin beats Kazuya, and then... Then we have some questions. I really wish that this story mode had like five more minutes just to wrap things up, we see Jin pulling up to Zhao Yu, now in America for some reason, and then the story just ends. We get a little credit sequence of the other Tekken fighters running a soup kitchen in New York as they help the city rebuild, and that's nice, that's a heartwarming moment. 
But man, it really feels like after some of the stuff that these characters just went through and some of the stuff that they saw and experienced, it feels like we should have had a little bit of all of them talking about it. There's a few things that I would like to know about what these characters have planned next after everything that went down. I mean, what's going on with G-Core? Did they disband? Is the war still going on? Are they still fighting across the planet? What happened with that? It's stuff like that that makes me wish that we had one more scene just wrapping all this stuff up. Also, it just occurred to me, I'm pretty sure I referred to G-Core as the Mishima Zaibatsu earlier in this video. I apologize for that. So, it's kind of a bummer that it just went right to credits. Well, except for the two post credit scenes which raise so... So many questions. First up, we got Kazuya lying motionless on the ground, and then you see June's shoes walk into frame. This is when things get confusing, because as I said, everything we saw really looked like June died. But after you beat this, you unlock June's separate story mode. And if you go and you play through that, then the announcer at the beginning of that story mode says that she lived. But the events of individual character story modes in fighting games aren't always canon, especially when it comes to dead characters being brought back for a story mode in a fighting game. A lot of the time, they just make stuff up to explain why a character is there. However, after going through all of that and after weighing everything that gets said in this game, yeah, I'd say that June is alive and so is Kazuya. I know a lot of people think that that last shot means that Kazuya is dead and that June is finding him in the spirit world, and that's what I thought too at first, but then I played through June's story mode and now I'm turned around on this. I think they're both alive. And I'm kind of torn on this, because on the one hand, you're not going to get a better final battle with Kazuya. If you won the ultimate final fight for Kazuya, this was it. But on the other hand, A, if this is supposed to be a story about Jin changing his ways and turning against his family's dark legacy, not murdering his dad is a good start. I mean, Kazuya murdered Heihachi, Heihachi murdered his dad, or more accurately, he buried his dad alive with the intent of him dying, but then a demon possessed him. Listen, don't act like that's weird compared to everything else that you've heard about Tekken. My point is, if Jin is finally breaking free of the darkness of the Mishimas, then he needs to break this cycle and not kill his dad. But also, while I am worried that we're not going to be able to top this fight with Kazuya after this game, we could take the character in a different direction. Remember, Kazuya was the original hero of Tekken, but then the devil genes started to corrupt him, and also he had that lifetime of family issues in the back of his head, so he ended up becoming the villain. But June was the one character who could reach out to him and saw the good inside of him. So if Kazuya is now free of the devil gene, what if Tekken 9 is Kazuya's redemption? It's June trying to help him remember that there is good inside of him. I'd actually be okay with that. Maybe we can even have Tekken 9 in with Jin and Kazuya having to team up against a brand new threat. But who would that new threat be? Well, it's time to finally talk about Reyna. Reyna pops up in this story, and I love Reyna because she has never been in any of these games before, and yet she shows up acting like she's the protagonist. To her, Tekken 1 through 7 were just the prequel to the actual game. There's that moment in the Coliseum where she has the slow-mo walk scene with all the other heroes going up against Devil Kazuya, and I couldn't help but chuckle at that when I saw Reyna because she just has that feeling of bro thinks she's on the team. Again, I love Reyna. This is not an insult. This is a positive. I love that she just shows up like, yeah, I'm the most important character here. Meanwhile, Kazuya is just standing there like, who is this sassy lost child? But okay, in all seriousness, Reyna is the daughter of Heihachi, and she is trying to learn all about the devil gene because she wants to activate her devil gene, so that way she can get revenge on Kazuya and everyone else for Heihachi's murder. And at the end of the game, after taking a blast head-on from Devil Kazuya, she wakes up, and this brush with death has activated her latent devil gene, making it sound like she is going to be the big villain of the next game. One question, though. How? How does Reyna have the devil gene? 
Not how did she activate it. No, the story does a good job of establishing that the devil gene comes out when someone comes close to death. So she keeps trying to get close to death by fighting Devil Kazuya. And then eventually, that works. Reyna nearly dying from that big blast from Kazuya was enough to awaken her devil gene. So no, I don't mean how did she awaken the devil gene, I mean how does she have the devil gene in the first place? If she is the daughter of Heihachi, Heihachi didn't have the devil gene. That was his wife, Kazumi. Kazuya got the devil gene from his mom, not from Heihachi. So how does Reina have it? I know I said earlier that Jinpachi, Heihachi's father, was possessed by a demon, but that happened after Heihachi buried him alive, so Heihachi wouldn't have it at all, and even then, that wasn't the devil gene. That was a completely unrelated demon. So I repeat, how does Reina have the devil gene? The way I see it, there's four options here. One is that they're saying anyone can have a devil gene as long as they just get close enough to death, but yeah, I'm vetoing that one. Do you know how many people have come close to death in Tekken? If that's all it took to awaken the devil gene, Heihachi would have awakened his like three times. Two, they're trying to imply that Heihachi hooked up with another woman who also had the devil gene, which I guess is possible, but I'm not putting that too high up there. Three, they're trying to imply that Reina was fighting Kazuya and Jin again and again, not just to learn about the devil gene, but also to try and absorb some of its power until she could make her own devil gene. Again, it's possible, but I don't think it's likely. Otherwise, Hua Rang and any of the other rivals in this franchise would have developed theirs a long time ago. Or four, maybe Reina isn't actually Heihachi's daughter. Maybe Reina was told as a kid, your dad is a Mishima, and she naturally assumed it was Heihachi because Kazuya was quote unquote dead when she was growing up. Let's think about that one for a second. They say multiple times in this game that Jin's home was attacked by Ogre seven years ago, and Jin was 15 at the time, meaning he would be 22 now. We don't know how old Reina is, but we do know that she's a college student, so there's a chance that she could be in her early 20s, meaning she and Jin could be around the same age so it is possible that Kazuya got another woman pregnant right before Heihachi threw him into that volcano. But I could be off on that. Reina does look a little bit younger than Jin, so it is unlikely that Kazuya had another child, at least in the conventional way. Remember, after Heihachi dropped Kazuya into the volcano at the end of Tekken 2, we then got a 15 year long time skip. And during that time, g Core pulled Kazuya out of the lava and spent years experimenting on him to bring him back to life, while g Core's chief rival was the Mishima Zaibatsu. And during these 15 years, the Mishima Zaibatsu had frozen Nina Williams, and it took her DNA and used that to create Steve Fox in an attempt to create the ultimate soldier. I'm just going to repeat that real quick for anybody who didn't already know that, because yes, that is a weird fact to learn completely out of the blue. Nina Williams was frozen during the 15 years between Tekken 2 and Tekken 3, and while she was frozen by the Mishima Zaibatsu, they used some of her DNA to create Steve Fox because they were trying to create super soldiers. Well, if I was running g Core at that time, I'd probably think, damn it, Mishima is up there creating super soldiers. Wait. Don't we have a super-powered fighter just lying around? Yeah, don't we have a former King of the Iron Fist tournament just sitting in storage? Well, if Mishima won super soldiers, I say we give him super soldiers. Yeah, that seems completely plausible to me. I seriously do believe that Reyna is actually the child of Kazuya, and that would explain all of this. And as for where the story could go from here, if Reina actually is Heihachi's kid, then I see the next game being Jin and Kazuya having to team up to take down the final remains of Heihachi's legacy. But if she's actually Kazuya's kid, I can see it going one of two ways. Either Kazuya starts to regain his humanity by spending time with Jun, and then when he sees his child Reina going around destroying the world, he realizes he has to go out there and stop her. 
and she becomes sort of a symbol of the darkness that was inside of him. And he has to realize that maybe he needs to actually reach out to her and be the dad for her that he couldn't be for Jin. Or maybe Reyna will end up killing Kazuya, only to then learn that he was really her father, not Heihachi. And after realizing that she accidentally killed her father, it would send her completely off the deep end. And I can totally see that happening, because if she is indeed a true Mijima, as I established earlier, killing your own father is probably the most Mishima thing you can possibly do. But I don't know where this story is going from this point forward, but I do have a lot of questions, and you know what? I'm excited to learn those answers. Seven years from now, when we finally get them. Oh, I miss back in the 90s and 2000s when brand new video games came out pretty much back to back. Anywho, let me know what you thought in the comments down below. Did you like this story? Who do you think Rainer really is? What will become of Kazuya and Jin? Let me know all that and more in the comments down below, or you can find me around the web on any of the usual socials. Blue Sky, Twitter, I'm on pretty much everything at this point. And if you like this video and you want to check out some other Tekken stuff, you've got some videos popping up right there, so make sure that you check them out. And if you like what you see, make sure that you click that subscribe button. This is the year of 100,000 subs. We're aiming for 100k by the end of the year. Let's make it happen. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Stay safe out there, and come back next time.